Hello there, yogis and karmic warriors. Welcome to the Karmic Warrior Podcast, where we talk about living an extraordinary life by practicing time-proven and tested teachings of yoga wisdom traditions. I am your host, Lisa Ingalls Witter, and the goal of this podcast is really quite simple. It's just to make it easier than ever before to find happiness and fulfillment for anyone in their everyday life by using wisdom teachings that have already been passed down to us for millennia and also to occasionally dispel some popular myths, especially in new age spirituality, which can hold us back without our even knowing. So be sure to subscribe to the podcast here on YouTube and anywhere that you can find podcasts. Now, before we hop into today's podcast, I want to make sure that you download my free ebook if you haven't already called Karma Demystified, where I reveal the secret to harnessing the law of karma, not the law of attraction, the law of karma, to finally break free of that one lesson that you keep repeating over and over again in your life so that you can live a freer, fuller life right now. And I put the link in the description below. <laughs> Hello there, karmic warriors. My guest today is Dr. Sally Adams Jones, and she is an expressive arts educator, a researcher, a counselor, and the author of this wonderful book called Art Making with Refugees and Survivors, which was actually published a few years ago in 2018. And the book has become very, very relevant during our times, especially as refugees from the Ukraine war are moving into Europe, are moving into Canada and the US, but also I feel as climate change and all the natural disasters that come with climate change are uprooting so many people from their homes and their communities. And in fact, the U.S. National Art Association has endorsed Sally's book to its 1,800 members to use as a resource in their classrooms to be more trauma-informed and to understand how art educators can facilitate deep healing through the expressive arts, which I believe is so, so important. So today we will be talking about her book and about this intersection between art and psychology and spirituality, which is really something that Sally loves to talk about. So I'm so delighted to have my guest here, Dr. Sally Adams Jones. Welcome to the Karmic Warrior Podcast. Thanks, Lisa. I'm loving this because you and I go back a long way. We've worked together in various situations before and it's fun to spend time with you again. Thanks. Yes, it really is. And just wonderful to be with you here. And um, we were talking a little bit in the green room before this, uh, and I was remembering back when I think we met in 2000, maybe 16 or 17, and you hadn't, you were actually just finishing your book, and then it had uh, gotten published while we were doing some work together. So um, something that you said that I think is very, very true about you, we, we talked about this as well as um, the book came out maybe a few years earlier <laughs> than, you know, it was it was prepared and ready to be to be there right when it needed to be there. You had already written it. And now it's like it's time. This book is such an important um, piece for what's happening in our world and for helping facilitators like yourself, other creative, uh, excuse me, expressive arts therapists or really I feel like any counselor, myself included, I have a background in expressive arts therapy, some studies in it, not to the extent that you have, but uh, reading your book, I'm reminded like, yes, I can draw more of this into the work that I'm doing with my clients. 
So I'd love for you to just give us a little bit of a, a background, a little history of your story, how you even came into this field um, of expressive arts therapy and your understanding of using it to heal trauma. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, it's a big, long story, so I'm going to just pick out little highlights. And I think the first thing I should mention is you and I share some common language around the, uh, the, the understanding of transformation from Ken Wilbur. And I'm sure lots of people know Ken's work. So he first gave me the language around the two principles of transformation, which is, well, there's several, but I'll just focus on the two, growing up and waking up. And those two threads have been with me my whole life. So the waking up path for me was yoga and the growing up path for me was expressive arts. Um, and I've had a whole journey around both of those. And when I bring them together, I realize they're the same practice and we can talk about that. Well, why are they both so helpful to us uh, transforming our levels of consciousness. And the main way is that when you practice the creative arts as a meditation, so many things begin to happen. So you can, you can really, and we can go into the yogic language around that too. So I come from the two streams, the spiritual dimension and the therapeutic and educational dimension. So on my website, you can see why those things necessarily overlap because they have common mechanisms for transformation. And that's why I'm pioneering this field is that nobody's kind of languaged or noticed that, that the more creative we become, the more empowered we become and the more we can participate in evolution. And so, and also the way we change our brains through meditative practice. So this is kind of a um, multi-level practice as far as I'm concerned, and we can go into that. Yeah, there's, my, sorry, carry on. There's so much there uh, and I'll just, and I want, I want to hear more of your story, but I just want to pause to say that in, in non-dual Shiva Tantra, it makes sense that, uh, you know, you, you talk about the creative, expre uh, creative expression is empowering because one of the powers of divinity is creation. It actually is an inherent power within us, is the power of creation. So when we're creatively expressed, we're living in our authentic power. Yes, exactly, Lisa. So that is my metaphysical paradigm, and you and I share that, in that we are fractals of the divine in terms of evolution being that creative process towards more and more complexity, love, coherence. Um, and so if we can find that as our own identity and learn the skills of that, we literally become mechanisms for the divine to work through us in, in the world. So I know that that's my spiritual paradigm. And so sometimes I separate that out when I'm talking from people who are just therapeutic because they're the same mechanisms, but I have to watch my language. So if you're fully open to us talking about the full spiritual metaphysical paradigm that we believe is true, you and I, um, then I have permission to talk about creativity as finding your, finding your voice and your whole way of being as an expression of the divine. Yes, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> and uh, tell us a little bit about your personal story. You talk about it um, in the book, in the introduction of the book, uh, your, your personal journey of, of experiencing trauma as an, as an immigrant from South Africa to Canada. 
Yeah, you can hear that I sound a bit funny. And that is because I, I was born and raised in Africa for 30 years. And so I only immigrated to Canada when I was 28. So I've lived half my life there and half my life here. Um, and I didn't realize at the time that the depression that I experienced after immigrating was evidence of the trauma that was going on for me with the separation from my family and my culture and my um, language and my friends and everything I knew and was supported by to come to a new country is now recognized as trauma. In the late 80s, early 90s, that wasn't even a word. It was just you having depression and nobody really understood it. So in retrospect, I now have the language around trauma and I fully understand what I was going through, which was grief and uh, which in order to start a new life and, and become functional, I had to repress and freeze that grief just to continue raising my family, building a house, starting a career, all the things you need to do to survive. What I was doing was repressing my grief and not feeling it, not expressing it. So I became depressed. And I now later as a therapist understand that depression is that repression of feeling and can be a result of trauma. So I, I now understand it because then I had to find the resources to heal it because it was not very functional for me to just repress all the pain and continue as if nothing had happened. I had severed my entire history, everything I was connected to and felt familiar with and supported and started a whole new thing that I had to learn about. Um, and there was a silencing around that story. Nobody wants to hear about your connection to a civil war they'd never heard about or how you were in danger of being imprisoned for your beliefs or how you had to leave your country in order to stand up for your anti-apartheid um, activities or that the secret police were watching your house and opening your mail or tapping your phone. That was just so out of the Canadian paradigm that that's part of me was silenced. I couldn't really tell that. Nobody wanted to hear that story. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing I did, which was a sign of trauma, was that story lived inside me and had no way of getting out, which was causing depression. Uh, and so I had to find out a way to heal myself. I was becoming really non-functional and that was not great as a mum. and so doctors were giving me medications which had terrible side effects and some of which increase your suicidal ideation they diminish your libido they make you fat they there's a whole bunch of stuff that some of the medications do and they're not necessarily that helpful some of them can be but they weren't working for me and so my psychiatrist eventually said, maybe you need electroconvulsive shock therapy because you're so depressed. Um, and at that point I said, no, I need to find my own healing. Um, not that I would say that's bad for some folks. It totally is absolutely applicable in some circumstances. I just decided I need to find a different way uh, and so I really dived into the yoga practice and the creative arts practice. And within two years, I was a completely different person. And I was set for life on my journey of understanding what happened. I changed my life and I became obsessed with trying to understand the mechanism. What was it that changed? How did it change? And can I look at it objectively and then see how I can help facilitate that for others? Because I was not only healed, I was set on an evolutionary path that exploded my life. I was flourishing. I was becoming much more connected, much more um, not only blissful and entering different states that I'd never experienced before, but just so much more functional and focused 
and quiet internally. My mind waves had settled down completely. I was beginning to really notice patterns in a much deeper way. Um, I was becoming much more concerned about not only myself and my family, but global issues. So my awareness had expanded outwards. My heart seemed to blow open from feeling numb. It was now feeling everything. It was such an amazing change that I then took post-grad studies on what happened. So that's what started my path to understand. I did a doctorate in what is transformation itself and how does that work through creative practice? Wow, what a journey. And of course, we all know that it's our own personal path that brings us to if we're really aligning with divine will and feeling into what does the divine want to express in me as me through me, um, that this is what will happen. <laughs> this is exactly what happened to oh. you. And it's really wonderful. And I want to talk a bit about, I mean, there's so much I want to talk about, but maybe first, because this word trauma has become commonplace now I mean you can read about it everywhere and there's tele and whatever um webinars and and online summits everybody knows about trauma I mean you know you hear everybody talking about trauma so we have clearly understood to some degree the importance of um really looking at how trauma plays out not just in you know, we used to think it was just Vietnam, the Vietnam vets or the vets, veterans of war. Um, as you say in your book, you point that out. Um, and now we understand, no, there's micro traumas, there's macro traumas. We all have trauma in our life to some degree or another. And in fact, as you were relating your story, I was realizing, wow, when I was a kid, we moved all the time that's traumatic. <laughs> you lose your sense of support, your friends. You're, I was realizing as you were talking about that. So there are these little things and trauma is, um, I would love to just talk a little bit more about your perspective of trauma, how you, how you speak about trauma. And then maybe we can connect that to the yogic view or, you know, the you know the basics of what I understand and I know you have such a deep deep practice in yoga and when I say yoga I don't mean just asana on the mat practice you practice all eight limbs uh, if we're looking at Patanjali's yoga um, so you have a very deep personal practice as well yeah this is such a great question Lisa and this is what I'm trying to pioneer is what is it that transforms? Um, and there are so many answers in, in Patanjali's book in the Bhagavad Gita that the answers are all there. So what I'm trying to do is relanguage that, drop the kind of the Hindu, the, there's, there's a lot of people have a problem with the Hindu language around that. And I'm just trying to make it clinical but I'm deeply rooted in the answers which are to be found in the yogic tradition. And also at the same time, be aware that the people I'm speaking to don't have any of that background. So how do I translate the same healing transforming mechanism into language they understand? And one of those words is trauma. So people are just in the, in the world of therapy, um, are beginning to talk about this thing called trauma, but we would understand it in yoga as blockages in the nadis. So, right. how, or kleshas, uh, the, yeah. in, it, things that create suffering or stop us from having samadhi. So understanding the body energetically doesn't translate to hard science. The, they see that as woo woo, metaphor and they are close to hearing it. I bridge the two worlds between hard science and 
what I would call the interior sciences. Um, so I get it. But so my challenge is to articulate these truths to a very, what you and I understand as rational world, when in fact, you and I have gone to the transrational. Uh, so this is a, my particular challenge is translation work of the great, great truths that have changed my life. Yeah, yeah it's, it is a hard thing to do. And I like how you, I don't know if you intended this in your book, but knowing you the way I know, you know, in the way that I know you probably did intend this, you, you define trauma as a pattern of response that gets, this is the key word, stuck in our physiology and implicit memory. And in, in yoga, uh, we would say, well, a samskara is an imprint. It, it, is, it is an undigested, it's an undigested emotion or experience that gets stuck. It's that same word. It's just stuck energy. And so like you're saying, you're, you're bridging that gap by really making it um, palatable to Westerners who aren't used to these yogic ideas. Um, and so you're using, you know, stuck in our physiology and in our memory. Now that feels like, that feels like something I can really understand if I'm not into yoga. And I just, I really appreciate how you've done that. Like I said, I don't, I'm guessing that was intentional and it's very subtle, but it's really the same. That's that word stuck is the same word that is used all the time in yoga wisdom teachings. It's, it's a, just a stuck piece of energy there. Beautiful. Yeah. So our Sanskrit word samskara would be the pattern. It's like, you have a little record player, that old LPN that's going and the needle's going in the same groove. Uh, and we develop, so that's, that has been noticed as something that occurs in our mind and body for 3000 years. Psychology is only about a hundred years old and it's only beginning to recognize the, the, the thing they call trauma uh, which is probably just one of the samskars we have lots, you know, but the freezing of energy would be a samskara. And it's an adaptive mechanism inside us for helping us survive. And so I, I want to also reframe the word trauma as something loving. It's not something we should be judging. It's something that we, our bodies did naturally in order to function in a very stressful time. And that normally includes shutting part of our energy down temporarily. So if, you know, as yogis, we all understand parasympathetic and sympathetic, the way the um, and Pingala work in our body, the two ways that our nervous systems work. One is fight and flight, and that's for survival. And, and we also know there's freeze, fawn, and flop. That was psychology's added to that. So they work together. And then there's also the parasympathetic, which is the nurturing, the, the taking of the digestive nourishment from the food, the sleep, the rest, the healing of cellules, the cellular body. So if we're stimulated from the outside by a threat, like me coming to a new country and not knowing how to survive, I got stuck in not so much fight and flight, but for me, it, it sort of went to um, freeze and flop. Um, and we now know that that's still part of that sympathetic nervous system it's just one that's got no energy in it it's frozen it's really frozen whereas fight and flight is all the energy moves into the arms and the voice and we come out as defenders i was i went into a withdrawal that's not parasympathetic although it looks like it from the outside it's still part of the sympathetic anyway um 
I don't want to get too technical, but trauma happens when we get stuck in the parasympathetic in some way. And that can look like a number of different uh, external ways of being. Fight, flight, fawn, flop, and freeze. Uh, and all of those are beautiful adaptation you can survive. And all in the right circumstance. It's just that when they get they become maladaptive, continues. So that's what trauma generally is, is we sh either shut down parts of ourselves because we don't have the resources to be attending to our healing and attending to the external world. So our external world needs to become safe enough for us to re-enter parasympathetic and start doing the healing work. Yeah. It's really amazing. I love, I love, thank you for laying that out. It's very, very helpful. And when you look at the creative arts, expressive arts as a mode for healing trauma, I, I'd love to look at that as, I know that you actually do a combination. You, you're, you in your work do the expressive arts, but it's not like you're saying no to cognitive behavioral therapy either. You bring that in as well. But I would love to just talk a little bit about why, why expressive arts is so important in the healing of trauma. Yeah, so um, there's a number of ways we could look at this. And part of, part of what happens during trauma is that you have a story that gets frozen inside you. So the importance of story is central to the expressive arts. Like, what are you going to express? You're going to express story in some way, whether it's through music or dance, gesture, sound, uh, performance, visual arts, textual written arts, you're going to be expressing a story of some kind, maybe somebody else's. Sometimes it's safer to express somebody else's story in a fictional manner, but actually you're expressing something about you that needs to be worked through. I've noticed that when I've written fiction, it looks on the outside like it's somebody else's story, but there's parts of it that are mine. So whatever we're doing, whether it's singing a love song or whether we're going to performance arts or we're expressing physically the energetic part of us that got frozen, that story that needs to be externalized in some way for us to be able to look at it objectively. So part of the healing mechanism is turning the subjective experience into the objective so that we get, get some distance from it we can look at it, we can begin to dialogue with it and, and process it. When, when we're still stuck in the subjective experience, we can't see the story. So part of the expressive arts is helping one to move from the pre-verbal experience of that story to help it come out in some kind of linear clarity to externalize it from the body onto something and you can see and understand the final part of the healing is that others can also witness it and you're no longer at that point alone the other definition of trauma is that the experience is so overwhelming and we imagine unique that we feel isolated and alone so one of the definitions of trauma is disconnection at your deepest core so Healing trauma is reconnecting you to community. And the way we do that is through storytelling and the expressive arts. So I'm curious, um, well, f first of all, I, I, I know the power of expressive arts having gone through my own personal studies and a massive process when I was in my early thirties of expressive arts is healing wounds and, and, and things, traumas that I didn't even realize I had until I started the process. In other words, I came into the process of expressive arts 
just because I was open and curious, but without, and interestingly, I didn't really have an agenda like, oh, I'm dealing with this thing from my past. It's, but it came up as I started to dance, as I started to create art and, and be witnessed in my process. So that just came to mind. But I also think the whole piece about story is really, really, it's so critical because in, I would say like, it's important that we're able to process this story but not get entangled with it. And I think that's what you're speaking to is we get, we're so close to our story. Um, we can't objectify it. We become so entangled with it. We think it's who we are. And when we think that that is who we are, we can't see who we really are. It's a case of mistaken identity. You, you can't even see the truth of who you are. So in, in the act of objectifying our own stories in a creative manner, it's an act of revelation. There's that which has been concealed, our true nature starts to become revealed because we've just disentangled ourselves from something that we are not and exactly and the stories i keep saying this that stories are stepping stones we need them they we need them for to get us through life but they're not the truth they're not truth with a capital t but we have to have them um so I find that interesting. I find that an interesting sort of paradox. It's like, okay, well, there's this whole, been this whole movement around, oh, just bust your beliefs and change your beliefs into new beliefs. Well, beliefs are just stories. Some beliefs are more useful stories than other beliefs, Adya Shanti would say. Um, tool, stories and beliefs are tools, not truths but we want to make them the most useful tools that we can. And what I hear you saying and what you doing with your work is that this is a way to make, to have our stories be the most useful tools that they can be and contributing towards our own awakening, waking up. I don't know if that. Yeah. You've just touched on so many things we need to unpack. One of which is witness consciousness. The act of getting that pre-verbal experience into verbal experience and then get it out of the body means we can then witness it. So we've got some of that distance. We are no longer, as you said, identified with it. Now, this is the critical factor, the yogic truth. Uh, the word asmita from the five glaciers is what blocks us from enlightenment is misidentification of the ego. Now, that can be with anything. That can be with your house, your body, your thoughts. In this case, your trauma. Part of trauma is that you're so stuck that you begin to believe it's you. You're identified with it. So part of the healing of the trauma is to get enough distance from it and weirdly enough, that's through languaging it somehow. It doesn't matter if it's images or words or song or gesture. Languaging the trauma helps you feel it again because you have to feel it to heal it. That's the only way the energy can unfreeze. As you unfreeze that terrified part of you that clamped up, and as you open that up, the energy begins to move. You have to feel it. You have to do the sobbing. You have to do the shouting, the wailing. Then you create this thing of beauty and you express it out of the body and others witness it. You have to do it with the right people uh, who know how to presence. And then you're in community again and you've turned it into an object that is now no longer you. So the book I'm writing right now is about the three ways to deal with story. And you raised such an important point that the 
difficulty with telling your story is that then you can become identified with the story. So the three ways of working with story is the past did happen. Like don't go into bypassing and say that past doesn't matter. It does. There's trauma. You need to investigate it. So that's telling the story is, um, is recognizing and honoring your journey. So there's the past, then there's the present. So coming into the present moment where you learn how to heal and drop the story. That's the next part of the healing is when you're witnessing it and when you're letting it go and when you're surrendering and coming into the present, trauma prevents you from being in the present. So don't bypass your trauma and say, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to start a new. No, you have to heal it. You have to witness it, honor it, love it, drop it in the present. And then as you begin to visualize the new story, you move into your future. That's imagination. That's visualizing. So we're in the past, we're dealing with the trauma. In the present, we're learning how to witness and meditate. And in the future, we're learning how to visualize and imagine. And so that is the flow. And when your psyche is not in connection with your natural flow, when it stops and gets blocked somewhere, your flow is blocked. So part of unblocking your flow is to recognize past, present, and future and learning the different skills. The past is therapy, the present is meditation, and the future is creative imagination. So that's why they're so important and why they're linked. It's really, I love that. With the way that I frame what you're, as you were talking about, the way I frame the future in my work is as opposed to creating, um, well, it, it, I guess I don't use the words imagine, but it would totally work. And what I am like trying to think of how I would say this, the way that I, and I'm wondering what your thought is on this, I guess, as I'm saying this and trying to articulate it, is that the future, if you're really connected with the truth of who you really are, you're not coming from separate self, egoic personality stories those old stories, but you're connected with the truth of who you are. That also means that you're most of the time, probably, especially in meditation, aligned with divine will. And so the future, creating the future becomes a natural expression that almost doesn't have to be something that we're grabbing for or trying for it just is the natural will of the divine it's this natural impulse that wants to be expressed that wants to be experienced and then it becomes the way of the karma yogi <laughs> just just doing that which wants to be expressed in you through you and as you so it takes this deep discernment of being able to tell the difference between is this what the divine wants to experience in me through me as me today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day, or is this coming from aversion or attachment or these types of things like where I'm, I'm, I'm still have, I, I am, I have expectations around the fruits of my actions versus I'm not attached to the fruits of my actions. Let's use some, some profound yogic language now around that. Ishvara Pranidhana is the surrender to the divine flow that wants to come through you. Right. So that's why we practice yoga. So that, you know, the, the, the eight limbs of yoga the, the last four in particular are really, really important. The, the uh, Pratyahara, the Dharana, and the Dhyana are the work of telling your story in the present, 
and learning how to meditate and dropping it so that your focus is now, is now in the present. You're, so, so that um, you're withdrawing your senses that are overwhelmed from the past, Pratyahara. You're, you're focusing your attention more on the present, the, the dharana, and learning how to do the dhyana, the meditative awareness of the present moment. Trauma stops you from being in the present moment. That's why we have to deal with it. Uh, so those skills, if you're doing story, no story, restory, part of the no story, the present moment is dropping it and learning how to come into the present moment, focus and enter meditative awareness. Um, once we can do that, we can, you and I have this language, we drop into what we call the true self. That's when we find our deepest identity, which is no longer identified with the past story. There's this deeper ground of our identity that we discover uh, once we learn how to meditate and that becomes who we are. Once we tap into that, all the future unfoldings are sourced in that, even our intentions. So the way we use our mind to create the future becomes fully aligned with that deepest identity that we can only find in the present moment. It's to be found nowhere else. So it's truly important to deal with the story in the past, learn how to drop the story in the present and learn how to restory your future. And you and I would call that karma to the service of the whole to evolution. How do we unfold that in the most embodied way that we can? And that's the creative part. That's where we literally co-creating with the divine at that point. You know, we've that's the language I would use for that is the tantric awareness that there is actually nothing outside of the sacred anyway, and that we're living into our deepest unfolding of that. Yeah, I was exactly going to use that as you were re rearticulating it, that this is the path of the Tantra. It is. It's the path of transcending and then including, like coming to use Wilbur's <laughs> terminology, transcending, but then coming back and bringing it all back with a new found awareness and a new center of gravity embodying it and being it and living in this juicy world and experiencing the fullness of life without saying no that never happened <laughs> without doing the spiritual bypassing like yeah so can yeah. i can i overlay this now it's perfect timing we all know the eight limbs i'm assuming your audience knows what the eight limbs are so there are also ways we can superimpose that on top of the creative act. So I just want to do that momentarily of why I see the link. It's so, let's stay, stay simple. You can practice creativity at about seven or eight different levels. Um, you can just learn the skills and become what we call a Sunday artist. Nothing wrong with that. You learn that in high school art. How do I draw a house? You need perspective. How do I do uh, perspective? You need shading, black, white, and color to get depth. So you learn just the basic skills. Most people love to just stop there. People who go on, for example, to do the arts at university, then take those basic skills they've had high school, um, and they will learn how to communicate beautifully. They will learn how to deal with story, whether that's in marketing, whether that's in performance art, visual art, creative writing. You're then taking those basic skills and learning how to fashion a story in your specialty. It doesn't matter if it's opera. That's pretty much what you're doing. How do, so the second level will be to communicate story. Uh, you, you can keep deepening the way you use creativity. I'll just be brief. You can use it as a healing mechanism, which is part of the work that I do, is how are we going to heal the trauma? You're working now with that story at a different level. 
So you've deepened that. You can then understand your personal story as your personal trauma, as in Wilbur's four quadrants in the lower right, as a political issue. You've had a lot of that trauma because of institutions and systems. And then you can take your creativity and start being an activist. How are you gonna change that for others? Um, then you can start opening that up more and more, going deeper and deeper into your true self until you are performing your creative act meditationally. You're now trying to source your creativity from the deeper, deeper layers of yourself uh, so that you're becoming one, your interior and your exterior. There's no separation as you're doing the act. And people say, I became the dance or I became the painting. You find that you bypass your ego completely at that point, it's dropped and you're coming from somewhere else. Most creatives get these peak experiences. You've hit this level of creativity randomly, but you can actually cultivate it so that you're there all the time. I'm going on and on. The final stage is when you are co-creating with the divine yourself so that there is literally no separation, not only in your mental state, but in your actions. You now bring that creativity through your body and you are a full fractal a partner of the divine and you are putting that into service, not for yourself anymore. You've opened up that channel, that central, the sushumna, the energy is just pouring through you and there's no separation. That takes skill because that also takes ethics, self-awareness, that takes a whole lot of knowledge and you need people checking you out that you're actually coming from a good place because that's powerful. Um, so anyway, this other book that's, that's I'm, I'm writing two books, the one about story, no story and restory, and also the, the yoga of creativity, how we can deepen at each level until we've understood that the basic skills we learned at high school can eventually lead us to becoming an expression of God. And there's ways in between that we can be working with that energy. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. So I can already tell, I'm gonna to have to have you on at least two more times for two more talk, talks about two more books <laughs> that you have forthcoming. Um, it's, I mean, I feel like we could just talk and talk and this is probably a good place to, to just wrap up our conversation. And it's always wonderful. I always learn so much when I sit with you and talk to you. And I just so deeply appreciate the impact that you've had on me personally in the years that we've been friends and just your, I do see your personal ethics. You mentioned that, and that's huge. The yamas and the niyamas, we can't even, you can't even go beyond in the eight steps of yoga without your yamas and niyamas or some version, whether it's the eightfold path or the 10 commandments or whatever it is for you, you need something to hold you accountable. And, um, I see that in you um, and your commitment to your practice. So thank you for just being an exquisite yogini on the path. <laughs> it's wonderful to watch. And um, I want to um, allow you to share your website. Um, again, the book is Art Making with Refugees and Survivors by Sally Adams Jones. And where else can people find you? Yeah, so you can find me on the internet at sallyadamsjones.com. And that web page, you know, because I'm a bridge between two worlds, there's not a lot of yoga language on there. Uh, it's because I feel like I have to be a gate for people. And as a counselor, as a, an educator, once they're with me, I begin to assess how far I can take them because I don't wanna lose people. Uh, part of learning integral stages of development um, is that we need to speak everybody's language. You become multilingual. So encounter me on my website. It's clean of yoga language, except it does mention on there that the highlights of my life have been 
my eternal gratitude to some of the greatest yoga teachers that I have studied with, uh, Satguru, Amrit Desai, Baba Hari Das, um, just BKS Iyengar, George Feuerstein, just, um, I don't even understand my karma, but I've brushed up against the world's greats and I have sat at their feet. So I do mention that, but I don't wanna scare people away. Once people are with me, we start looking at, where can we take this person? What language can we use here? And how can I help open up in a safe place? Do we just need to focus on the trauma? Do we, do we bring in, that's the past story. Do we bring in the meditative skills? And my favorite, do we completely take you into the voice expressing your authentic essence and, and building a future? So we do that hand in hand. The client determines the journey and uh, I'm there for them as far as they want to go. And I would highly recommend working with Sally. She's just of uh, such knowledge and, and not even just knowledge, like conceptual knowledge, but deep wisdom, like knowingness that I always talk about. If you watch any of my videos that there's a difference between conceptual knowledge, intellectual knowledge, and a deep felt knowing wisdom. Sally has that wisdom and that experience. So highly recommend. And might I say that you, whoever is drawn to this work, you sit on your bed in your pajamas with your box of Kleenex and we have a telehealth link um, and we can do it anywhere, anytime. And I've noticed that the more relaxed the people are, in their own home and the safer they feel, the deeper we can go. So I would invite you to explore that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Sally, thank you so much for being on the Karmic Warrior podcast and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa, so much.